Welcome to the 10th webinar in a series sponsored by ABET. Today's topic is developing rubrics. Although you will not be able to be heard on the webinar, you will have an opportunity to post questions to the speaker. You will notice a question box on the right-hand side of your screen. Please post any questions you might have for the speaker in that box. There will be several times throughout the webinar where we will stop and address questions that have been posted. If we cannot get to your question during the webinar, we will post all unanswered questions in an FAQ format and send it to you after the meeting. A couple of reminders. You should have downloaded the slides from the email sent to you, so you will have the materials we will cover during this session. I would also like to remind you that you will receive a CD with the complete webinar and copies of the slides in about three to four weeks. Today, I, Regina Kreitz, will be moderating the session, and Dinah Breedis will be the presenter. Dinah Breedis is a faculty member at Michigan State University in the Department of Chemical Engineering and Material Science where she also serves as our Programs Coordinator of Assessment and Evaluation Processes. She holds a Ph.D. in Chemical Engineering from Iowa State University and a B.S. in Engineering Science from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. She is a member of the, IA, the AICHE and ASEE. Over the past 25 years, Dinah has served AVET as a Program Evaluator for AICHE a team chair and member of the Engineering Accreditation Commission, the first chair of the EAC Training and Materials Development Committee, and an executive committee member of the EAC. She was a program evaluator on one of the very first EC 2000 visits and subsequently chaired several new criteria visits. Dinah has been an AICHE representative director on the ABEP Board of Directors and has been involved in the design teams for the new program evaluator and train the trainers training materials. She's a lead facilitator for the program evaluator training sessions. She also con consults in the area of assessment and evaluation. She was elected a fellow of ABET in 2007. At this time, I'll turn the webinar over to Dinah Breedis. Thank you very much, Gina. I appreciate that introduction. I think the takeaway message from all of that is that I'm probably no different than um, most of you out there, so the, I hope that the ideas I can share today are some that you can use as well. Um, our experience in our own department um, in using rubrics has been good, and I think the takeaway message is that rubrics can be very useful in your assessment and evaluation processes. There is an investment, uh, a learning curve, but ultimately they can be very useful to your program improvement. So the things that we're going to talk about today uh, include the following. We're going to talk about the overall context or framework for rubrics. Um, underlying all of this will be the whole idea of making outcomes measurable. We'll talk about what is a rubric and give definitions. Uh, we'll talk about the relationship of rubrics to something called performance indicators. And then we're going to talk about how those performance indicators and rubrics will support outcomes assessment. Whether it's ABIT related or not, I think this is uh, a reason that most of you are probably on this webinar, is to uh, understand more and improve your uh, outcomes assessment processes. We'll also talk about different kinds of rubrics and then how you make choices among those different kinds of rubrics. And finally, and probably most importantly, is how to apply uh, these rubrics. As Gina mentioned, we're going to allow time for questions as we move along, but um, and having listened to other webinars, I find it a good practice to jot questions down as you go. So rubrics um, can be applied in various ways, and they're not just for outcomes assessment, and I plan to highlight this as we go along. Uh, in general, they're good for any type of process. It might even be involved in research programs and so forth in terms of uh, evaluating. Um, relative to accreditation, I just wanted to show you a couple of screenshots about the current level of importance assigned to rubrics. This is a screenshot from one of the modules from the program evaluator training. Gina mentioned that I uh, have the privilege of being a lead facilitator for the training and the whole use of uh, direct assessment and quantitative assessment and the use of rubrics is emphasized in this uh, training. So if you go to the next screenshot here and look at the table, right in the middle of the table is a description of performance indicators and the emphasis again there is that 
performance indicators allow you to measure outcomes, that they give you something to hang your head on as far as measuring outcomes and doing that in a, in a consistent way. So this is being emphasized for the new program evaluators. Uh, you're more than welcome to take that website and look through all these training materials uh, yourself, the pre-work materials. And module four is the one that emphasizes some of the concepts that we'll be talking about today. So next I'd like to, like to talk about the context, the big picture of how rubrics fit into program improvement processes. And the way I picture it, when, when we begin to develop program improvement processes, we start with this umbrella concept of the program educational objectives, which is mission driven. And we follow through to the program outcomes which support those objectives. And then what we're going to talk about today is the the performance indicators and how those are part of the program outcomes in a, in a more detailed way. And then finally, how the rubrics are used to uh, evaluate the, the performance indicators. When we go up the right-hand side of that diagram, when we're actually performing the assessment and evaluation processes, <clears throat> we start with the rubrics, uh, use those uh, on a regular basis in our programs, use those to evaluate the performance indicators, which tell us something about program outcomes and which ultimately build to supporting the program educational objectives that our graduates uh, demonstrate when, when they're in their careers. I'm also assuming um, a general familiarity with the language of accreditation, so I'm assuming that everyone understands the concepts of educational objectives and program outcomes and so forth. So for this process, whether you're developing a, an improvement process or whether you're applying a pro program improvement process, rubrics are key to both, both methods, both processes. So we'll talk about what a rubric is. It's an explicit a statement of expectations on student performance. Now, this can be used for grading or it can be part of a grading process, but we like to emphasize that assessment and grading are not the same thing. The point there is that rubrics are, are much more detailed, much more specific than the concepts that we use to assign a grade in a course. Rubrics are used to describe the very specific characteristics at, for each level of performance at which we're evaluating our student work. So whether it's a, a student paper or student exam, the rubrics describe specific features of what the student is doing to, to demonstrate an outcome. And the rubrics also provide those people being assessed, in this case students, very clear information about how, how they've performed. It's a good communication tool between the student and the faculty member uh, to help the students understand how they can improve their performance in the future. So it, it's a good communication communication tool as long as we give our students these rubrics, of course, uh, for them to look at ahead of time. But it's a good tool for student learning. Uh, rubrics uh, are an assessment scale, as I've, as I've mentioned before, and um, we'll be talking more about the concept of the levels of achievement for each of these performance indicators. Again, performance indicators are a, a finer discrimination in, in outcomes and we'll see a hierarchy uh, in, in a, a following slide here. The other important thing that um, rubrics help you do is to set thresholds for acceptable student performance. And now the uh, ABET criteria for all four commissions indicate that we have to indicate the level to which students attain a certain performance so that this, the idea of thresholds becomes very important. There are uh, several scales that can be used for rubrics. Uh, they can, the scales can be numeric, 1, 3, 5, 1, 2, 3. Uh, and we'll talk about how many of these uh, you need later. <clears throat> they can be descriptive, and they can also be simply black and white. Either something exists about the student performance or it doesn't. And there are uh, appropriate times to apply uh, any of those three scales. So there is an implication here that there's a hierar hierarchical relationship, and the next slide kind of breaks that down for us. So if we, we have an outcome, 
it's a broad, fairly broad statement, and the performance indicators are used to break that into observable pieces. So what is it that the student is doing specifically to demonstrate that outcome? And, and in this example, I'm showing an outcome broken down into four performance indicators. Uh, subsequent to that, each performance indicator is broken down into levels uh, with specific descriptions about what the student is doing at each level. And in, in this case, we have the lowest level being the one where the student needs improvement, the middle level being the level where the student meets the expectations, and the highest level being where expectations are exceeded. So if we have four performance indicators and three levels, we have a total of uh, 12 descriptions of student performance that map back into that outcome. So that kind of paints the picture of how this hierarchy between outcomes, performance indicators, and levels is set out. So what is a rubric? Um, and, and this is intended more to discuss how, do you, how you would construct a rubric. So rubrics generally contain three components. There is the dimension, which is the performance indicator, which is the, uh, the breakdown of the outcome into finer pieces. There is the scale, which is the levels of performance. On the previous slide, there were three described levels of performance, one, three, five. And there's also the description of what that performance looks like at, at each level. And again, that was indicated on the previous slide, too. And the next slide, we're going to look at how this might be portrayed in a table or in a map. So let's suppose we have the outcome uh, dealing with communication skills. And on the left-hand side in the yellow, you see four different performance indicators that might be used to describe student behaviors uh, when they are demonstrating communication skills. And then you might have four different levels, unsatisfactory, developing, satisfactory, and exemplary. And the dimension would be then the performance indicator. That's one of the pieces of a rubric. There are the scales, in this case, one through four. And then the descriptors, they're not shown here, but each cell would have a, a written description of what the student performance looks like, uh, say, for performance indicator number one at an exemplary level, and so on through that entire table. Uh, the yellow column here is meant to indicate that that's the threshold, that that's the acceptable level of performance, and that's what we're looking, our, looking um, for in our students. In, in order that, that they attain at an acceptable level. The next slide just shows this same table rearranged in a slightly different order. Uh, how you arrange these is basically up to you, but we still have the, um, the, the same three elements, the dimension, the scale, one through four here, and the descriptors. So rubrics have these three components that we just mentioned. They can be used for both formative and summative purposes. We don't always have to wait until the end of the semester to uh, assess an outcome. This can also be used for formative uh, classroom improvement. So you can use it for classroom assessment uh, throughout the semester. You can also longitudinally uh, determine how students are improving through the course. Um, it's a way, as I mentioned before, to define expectations for students, and particularly this is a, a good tool when you're dealing with uh, abstract concepts and abstract processes. Um, for example, lifelong learning. What is lifelong learning? What does it look like when a student is demonstrating lifelong learning? Or ethics and professionalism, what, what do those look like? So when we think about how to break outcomes into these performance indicators and the rubrics, uh, this really helps us get a grasp on what, what that really means to us. And finally, when students and faculty communicate, if the students have that rubric, there's a common language to help uh, faculty and students talk about what's expected. And finally, uh, rubrics uh, increase inter-rater reliability when multiple faculty members are conducting assessments. If you have more than one section of a course and you have a couple faculty that are uh, assessing in, in both of those sections, then it this kind of tool helps helps the consistency from one faculty member to another, or from one year to another. So now we have any time for, uh, we have time for questions. Gina, do we have any questions at, at this time? 
There are no questions right now. Thank you. Okay, very good. So that was just an introduction of um, where we're going with rubrics, how to construct them, what the elements are. So next we'd like to talk about the context uh, for rubric development. And there's a context that's ABET criteria driven, um, and there's also the, the context of just general process improvement, or program improvement. ABIT just had its annual meeting last week, and um, next year we'll have new criteria that will look more similar across all four ABIT commissions. So the next couple slides illustrate some of the differences between the criteria that exist currently and the criteria that we will have in place next year. Um, this is an excerpt from the 2010 definitions uh, provided in the criteria. And um, I'd like to point out the underlined sections. Uh, program outcomes are uh, defined with this statement that you can read. And the importance of performance indicators here is, is also demonstrated that they are specific measurable statements that uh, identify performance that, that meets outcomes. And we have definitions of assessment and evaluation as well. You'll see that in the 2011 criteria, these definitions have been uh, expanded. First of all, notice that program outcomes will now become student outcomes. And performance indicators still have the same definition, but the uh, definitions of assessment and evaluation have been expanded. Specifically, I want to point out that in assessment, the effective assessment uses relevant direct um, measures. That has been added now to the, the language in, in the criteria. So the idea of direct measures and how rubrics can help you achieve that is one of the important aspects of this, of, of this seminar. So as far as the process of assessment evaluation that was illustrated on the, on the previous slide, this is um, a diagram of how we in our program envision outcomes assessment and uh, evaluation of program educational objectives. Um, I believe you can see my mouse since I'm sharing my screen, but the, we have students coming out of an academic program and the outcomes are measured before the students, or at the time of graduation, or at any, any time before graduation. This is where um, performance indicators come into play. This is where we use performance indicators to determine if students are achieving at a particular level uh, in the outcomes areas. So these outcomes um, assessment results are, are fed back compared to thresholds that we've set in our programs, and if, if they're not achieving at the appropriate threshold level, we change our educational practices and strategies uh, in our academic programs to improve them and to improve the student performance in the outcomes areas. Um, similarly, we have the graduates, and those, um, the graduates are, we evaluate their achievement in program educational objectives. That's, that's the bigger loop. Uh, we're not dealing specifically with that today, but I just wanted to point out that the program educational objectives basically drive this process with outcomes, educational practices, and strategies. Um, the evaluation that occurs um, occurs in two places, the evaluation of the achievement of outcomes and the evaluation of attainment of program educational objectives. So on the previous slide, you noticed that there was a de definitions for assessment and evaluation. And this diagram just illustrates how those concepts fit into the broader assessment picture. So ABA criteria does now mention that we need to use direct assessment, uh, but it doesn't tell you how to, how to do it. Um, the strong feeling that we have is that in order to measure it, you have to know what you're looking for, so you have to define it. And the key question here is, what is it going to look like? What are faculty going to see when students uh, are, are performing at an outcome, are performing elements of an outcome? How do you know whether or not an outcome is being attained and if we're going to be setting thresholds to what level? The other important factor is that we, as faculty, need to decide what does it look like in our program. Uh, program A may have a different requirement, a different threshold for an outcome. They may see an outcome entirely different 
differently than, than we see an outcome in our program. So these um, performance indicators and rubrics can, can look different from one program to another. So if we get down to more details about performance indicators, <clears throat> these are those specific measurable uh, statements that, that tell us what students are doing when they're demonstrating an outcome. And what we look for, and in all accreditation processes, programs are responsible for providing that evidence. Uh, the evidence that defines the program outcomes and focuses the, the data collection, the, the rubrics help set you up in how to, how to do this collection process in a systematic way. There's the danger of over-assessing and gathering too many data, but I think that uh, rubrics will help you kind of focus that so that uh, you get the data that you need, you get the evidence that you need. Uh, per performance indicators are also high-level indicators of the achievement of program outcomes. So uh, setting thresholds, we know what to look for. So if we talk about developing performance indicators now, how do you construct a performance indicator? There are two essential parts to performance indicators. The first is the content referent. This is the subject. It's the subject that's the focus of the instruction. What is it that the students will do? Uh, are there steps to a design process? Are there steps to problem solving that we're looking for? Do they apply the scientific method? What kind? Of, how are they demonstrating the communication skills? These are all the subject content re reference in performance indicators. The next piece of performance indicator is the action verb. What is the student doing? Are they listing something? Are they analyzing? Are they applying? And when you put these two pieces together, uh, you can develop a performance indicator, performance indicator that describes very specific attributes that make up an outcome. So the action verb that um, you might consider, there are multiple resources to help with, with these action verbs. And we can even get into Bloom's taxonomy with these as we build from the novice to the intermediate to the advanced um, student. You can see some of these action uh, verbs that will be showing you where you introduce concepts, you reinforce concepts, you demonstrate or create. And, and you can build some of these verbs into your performance indicators so that performance indicators might be used um, in, in a project where they're only asked to demonstrate to a, an outcome to a very low level or at a higher level where they're asked to do synthesis or evaluation. So the performance indicators set these specific expectations. Um, they're developed for the program outcomes and they also help faculty members develop curriculum and uh, assessment procedures. For example, if you are going to be designing an exam to test a certain outcome and you have a list of performance indicators, um, my strong belief is that this helps us write better exams. This writes, helps us write better assessment processes, assessment uh, tools, so that knowing what to look for helps us write a better exam or propose a better project. Um, the primary difference that we see between performance out, program outcomes and performance indicators are that program outcomes are very general and, and relatively broad. And so you can't measure specifics about them. And that's why we need performance indicators. So if we just take a, a couple of examples of sam sample program outcomes. Uh, one of them might be that students will have an understanding of social influences that affect technology, or that students will be able to work on a team, or that students will be able to apply principles of math and science to a technical problem, and that students will be lifelong learners. These are very, very broad statements, and if you try to assess these uh, for an individual student's work, it's very difficult to gauge their level of performance and know exactly what to look for. That's why we have performance indicators where we're looking at very concrete actions, um, what the student will be able to perform as a result of, of uh, this participation in, this, in our program or as a result of, of doing this project. <clears throat> 
So again, going back to some of those verbs that we may use in describing what the students will do, this is just a resource for you to use um, afterwards, uh, after the webinar, if you are writing rubrics. This is a, a, a good list of, of verbs to use uh, as we go up the uh, Bloom's level from all the way from knowledge to evaluation. Uh, these are good words to use. Um, there are some words that shouldn't be used so much, for example, an understanding of, and that's used quite often. Uh, but for example, for knowledge, you look for the student to define things or identify things or label things. So you can write your performance criteria, uh, your performance indicators with these verbs, all the way up to evaluation where a student, student will choose or assess or compare. Uh, so I, I just offer this as a resource to you. There's also a kind of a neat diagram that um, we have available. This is the hexagon that even goes further into different kinds of activities that a student might do to demonstrate a particular performance and a particular outcome. So the next thing that um, I'd like to do is to start as we uh, go from our program educational objectives down to the program outcomes and then look at how we might write performance indicators that support those outcomes. So let's suppose that we have the program educational objective that graduates will be effective lifelong learners um, and that they will demonstrate professional and ethical responsibilities. So in that case, students will, the outcome that supports the achievement of this program educational objective is that the student will demonstrate lifelong learning skills and will understand ethical responsibilities. So those are the broad statements. Now we have to write more detailed performance indicators of what the student will actually be doing to demonstrate these. So let's just pick one. Here we're just going to look at understanding ethical responsibilities. So on a very basic level, the student might demonstrate knowledge of the professional code of ethics. Um, they know that um, safety is the number one uh, code of ethics conduct in, for engineers. Um, they can list others and that they, they basically know that they exist. The higher level uh, performance indicator then would be that they know how to evaluate the ethical dimensions of a problem in a discipline. And you can imagine some uh, projects and problem statements where you could see both levels of performance in one project where they know that they have to list the professional code of ethics, which ones apply, and then they use some kind of ethical decision-making model to evaluate um, an ethical problem. <clears throat> Let's take another example. Here the program educational objective that we're talking about is that graduates will be able to demonstrate ability to solve complex problems and that they'll be able to function in a team. So the program outcomes that support that would be that the student will demonstrate an ability to formulate and solve problems. That's one of the ABET outcomes. And that they'll be able to function on a team. So those outcomes directly support that program educational objective. So if we just focus on the, the team outcome, we can write some performance indicators that support that outcome. So we break it down into a finer grain that the student uh, will research and gather information, that the student will fulfill the duties um, given that student in their roles in the team, that they share in the work of the team, and that they're good listeners. So those performance indicators really break down on a finer scale what it means and how a student will demonstrate the ability to function effectively on a team. So here's an example of a, a rating of various students, different students. There's space for four students here and how they function on a team. So we took those attributes, those performance indicators, and listed them for each student. And then the um, rater is asked to rate each student on a scale of one to four. And then those scores are added up and the, the student is given an average score for the ability to um, to perform or work on a team. There is one issue with this rubric that I see and that you probably see as well in that 
the description of what it looks like to perform at an unsatisfactory level versus an exemplary level is not given. In other words, those descriptors are missing. Um, this rubric, though, can have value um, if it's pretty straightforward. If those detailed descriptions aren't necessary, there's certainly value in having something like this, too. Uh, this might be something that you could use as a grade sheet, for example, um, and it would be very handy uh, for, for grading student uh, teamwork skills. So the next uh, item that we'd like to talk about is the purpose of rubrics. The, the purpose drives the decision about, about which rubrics to use. So the questions you should ask yourself is, what kind of feedback do you want? Do you want to look at individual students? Do you want to look at the program? Or do you want to look at very specific items about student performance? Do you want to look at their ability to use a computer tool? Or do you want to look at, more generally, their ability to solve problems regardless of the tool that they use? The other question you should ask yourself is how will the data be used? Um, are you using this for formative course evaluation, course assessment? Or is it a, a summative assessment of how your students are doing at the end of the junior year or at the end of the senior year. This can be a developmental or a longitudinal study, or you can just look at a snapshot in time. So rubrics can be used in, in any one of these ways and for any one of these purposes. The other um, question one should ask is, for whom is the rubric intended? Is it intended for the students to guide their completion of the project? Is it intended for the faculty member to help as an assessment or a grading tool? Or, or will it be used by the program, that is, for the entire uh, faculty uh, as they assess outcomes in the curriculum? And that might affect the way that, that you write the rubrics. So how are you going to use the rubric? Is it going to be an overall examination of student performance, specific information, about student competence. Um, so you have to consider these factors. Um, and um, what the specific information might give you about student competence is that it provides you some information about how to diagnose the problem, if there is one. And specifically, the more specific you, could, specific you get with your rubric and your performance indicator, the more specifically you know where to go back and address the problem. Um, are they having trouble with setting up differential equations? Then you know to go back and maybe look at some of your differential equations class. Are they having trouble using a computing tool that gives you a very direct evidence of where you need to go back and fix the problem? So we're um, coming up again on a, a time for questions. Everything is going great, and there, again, there are no questions. Okay. I'm not sure if that's a good sign or not, but I guess we'll move forward. <clears throat> so there are types of rubrics that can be used. Um, two main types. The first that we're going to talk about is a holistic rubric. And in a holistic rubric, there is an overall judgment that's made by the rater of the uh, overall impression of the performance uh, of a student. And, and it it's mapped into a, a scale, a level, that you'll see on one of the following slides. Um, there's, a, there's categories, and each category contains kind of the laundry list of behaviors that you will see for a student performing at, at that particular level. So the next slide is a, is a holistic rubric on the ability to work effectively in teams. So here you see there are different attributes that are listed under each level. So um, un, uh, let's start with the satisfactory one. That apparently is the, the threshold for uh, acceptable students' performance. It talks about how they collect information. It talks about how they uh, perform their assigned duties. Uh, it talks about how they listen. So all, all those performances are, are all listed under one level. Uh, and similarly, in a, in a parallel way for the other levels. So um, we don't rate performance of each, of each indicator. We just look at the whole. Now, the problem here is that you might have performances that are between, uh, say, level two and level three. So it, it, there might be a, 
more judgment that has to be used in the use of holistic rubrics and that judging exactly whether a student falls in level two or three or somewhere in between. So let's look at some of the results. Um, let's assume that you have a, a set of, um, of values that you've attained for students and that 50% of the students performed at uh, an acceptable level for a given outcome, and in this case, working effectively in teams. So the percent that met the target was 50%. Uh, whether that's acceptable or not depends on where your program sets the level, but the point on this slide is, is that it's very difficult to know what to go back and fix. If this indeed is an unacceptable level, it's unclear uh, what you would do to improve your program. There's not enough detail that's provided by uh, the holistic rubric to guide your program improvement. So holistic rubrics certainly have advantages. Um, they can be pretty generic, and they're generally a little easier to write than the analytic rubrics. They can, because they are general, though, they can be used with many different tasks. Um, they're, they don't necessarily have to be written for a particular project, although they can be. Um, they save time. They're easier to apply because you're just looking at the four levels at, rather than each performance indicator, each of the four that was um, under each level in the previous few slides. And um, the train raters can apply these more consistently um, in, in that it becomes now a more reliable measurement. The disadvantages that we've already mentioned before is that you don't get any specific feedback about the strengths and weaknesses of student performance. All we knew from that uh, previous slide was that 50% of the students performed at an acceptable level for teamwork. We don't know what, what they did wrong, if there were things that they did wrong, uh, what the other 50% did. So um, there's missing information, certainly. So they might meet the performance in a couple of the categories, but not in others. And so when it's averaged out, it's difficult to tell uh, where to improve. And it, you can't weight the various indicators uh, different, differentially. So that if an aspect like uh, gathering research is an important aspect of teamwork for your program uh, versus listening, which may not be as important, there is no way to weight those in a holistic rubric. The next, uh, the other kind of rubric is an analytical rubric. Uh, analytic, analytical scales tend to look at each dimension separately uh, so that you use these performance indicators that we've been talking about more explicitly. And you look at the various levels of performance uh, for each indicator. They're all presented separately and they are rated separately for each um, case of, of assessment. Um, you associate different point values with the descriptors from high to low, um, and we'll talk about how many points are, are appropriate in the scale of, of levels. So let's take a look at now the same outcome of working effectively in a team. Here on the left-hand column, we have each of the performance indicators. So instead of being buried in among the levels, now they're broken out specifically. So we have the same attributes, the gathering of information, the, the duties, the sharing the work, and the listening, except now each level of performance for each performance indicator is described. Again, uh, satisfactory performance is the threshold for acceptable performance. Uh, but now the rater knows exactly what the student will be, what to look for in the student performance in order to rate them at a certain level for each performance indicator. There's a lot more detail here. Um, if, there's a, if there's a weakness, we know more specifically what to uh, go back and fix. So that when you analyze the data, you may have a representation uh, such as this one, where you can uh, rank uh, or, or collect the data on the students and determine the percentage that meet the target performance for each performance indicator. And then if you, for example, set your target at 80%, I think that that line has slipped a little bit, and it was meant to be at 80. 
but um, you can see that the students are not performing at acceptable levels in the area of gathering research and in, in their roles in the team and in sharing in the work. Um, they are good listeners, though, and so when we try to improve our, our program, our curriculum, our courses, um, we, we know more specifically where to, where to turn to uh, affect the improvement. Um, we've also seen these kinds of mappings where performance at each, not just the students that achieved the level of performance, but where each of the levels are mapped, and so you can see the whole spectrum of student performance. Now this is getting to be very detailed, but there are programs that do it this way. Uh, it depends on, again, what the purposes of your assessment are as to how detailed you want to get into these kinds of display and analysis of data. So the advantages of an analytical rubric are the um, specific feedback that you get about strengths and weaknesses in student work and in student performance. Uh, you can weight these as to which are more important for your program and which aren't. We didn't demonstrate that in the, in the, in the mappings on the previous two slides, but, but you could certainly do that. And you can also use these to demonstrate as, as students progress through the program, how they're improving. Um, when you assess that same performance indicator repeatedly through the program, starting from, say, freshman year through the senior year, you can chart that um, improvement in performance as, as uh, students mature. The disadvantages of analytical rubrics are that they are um, more difficult to create and use. Um, our program went through uh, a period where we involved our curriculum committee in creating rubrics for our program, and we had a, a lot of work that and time that was invested into that. Um, ultimately, it was it was very useful for us. It was productive, and we don't regret the time that we spent. But we did spend some time. Um, they're also a little bit more time consuming to use because now you're ranking various performance indicators each at all of the levels, so there are multiple things to check. Um, we've seen this happen in our program in that there are, are more possibilities for raters to disagree. It's not quite as straightforward as the holistic rubric where there are essentially fewer choices to make, but when you have more choices to make, you're going to get more uh, variability and uh, inter-rater reliability will diminish. You can um, counteract that by training raters, um, but I have to admit that often faculty aren't willing to um, go through that kind of training, which can be quite extensive. So um, you have to make choices about when you might want to use holistic versus analytical rubrics. If all you need is a snapshot of achievement, um, how did they do on this project versus how did they do on this specific performance? indicator, then a holistic rubric is perfectly fine. Uh, if you're just looking at a single dimension uh, that will help you understand student performance, holistic rubrics are, are, are perfect. But um, if you would like to use analytical rubrics when you need to break things down into a finer scale, when you need to have more detailed information that drives your program improvements, um, and when you have a complicated skill that is difficult to assess in a holistic way when you need to look at the various features that comprise that skill, then analytical rubrics are, are very important. Um, students um, are often asked to assess themselves, uh, and that's often used to support uh, program uh, assessment, program outcome assessment. Um, generally, that is a, not, should not be the primary way of assessing students. The primary way of assessing students should be uh, in using their work. But if you give students analytic rubrics that in detail describe their various um, elements of, of an outcome, the, the performance indicators, they can actually, students can actually do a pretty good job of assessing themselves if you explain using performance indicators and rubrics exactly what an outcome means. Another um, point to consider when, when choosing a uh, type of rubric to use is whether it's going to be generic or task specific. So a rubric that is generic can be used 
uh, across the program in all the courses where you consider that outcome. So for example, if you're looking at problem solving skills or communication skills, that rubric can be written in a general enough sense that can ap and apply in a design class versus a, a, a freshman intro class. If you'd like to design a task specific rubric, then it's, it's really focused towards a particular project, a particular assignment, maybe the evaluation and assessment of a particular exam, and it's much more difficult to generalize that rubric across a wide variety of uh, student work than it is if you use a generic one. Now, in our program, again, just to draw on that as, as an example, we wrote generic rubrics and then fine-tuned them um, to, to match the kinds of things we were doing across our curriculum so that we minimized the number of rubrics that, that the faculty had to use. And that made comparisons between courses, between different uh, class levels, much easier when we applied the generic rubrics. For grading, on the other hand, uh, task-specific rubrics are invaluable. <clears throat> I've mentioned this a couple times um, in, the, in the presentation. Uh, up till now is how many points to put on the scale. Uh, generally, um, that will depend on what you're, what you're looking at, what you're grading, the purpose that you have for the scoring. But in general, uh, the recommendation is, is that three to five points be used to describe uh, student achievement at, at any point in time. There are schools of thought that say, schools of thought that say that that should be an odd number um, so that people aren't always defaulting to the middle. Um, but I, I think when descriptions are provided in enough detail, that shouldn't be a problem. Um, if you're really focusing on a developmental curriculum, there might be more points that are needed. In other words, uh, as an example, 6 to 11, but that can get extremely tedious for faculty to, uh, to go through that exercise and even to have enough understanding of uh, an assessment process to discriminate to that fine of a degree. So the more points on a scale, the more difficult it is. The more choices there are, again, the more that affects um, comparisons among faculty member ratings. So when you're developing rubrics, assuming that after this webinar you choose to do that, and, and this is to summarize this section, uh, you need to uh, have clear in your mind how that rubric is going to be used if you're using that for program assessment, for example, for accreditation, or if you're using that for individual student assessment and formative assessment uh, as a, an assessment of a, an exam or a project or a senior design. You also have to choose whether you're going to use an analytic or a holistic rubric. Um, for process improvement, the analytic rubric is clearly better in that it provides very detailed information and tells you exactly where to focus your improvement efforts. Um, when in doubt, you can often use student work, and look at it and say, now how would I assess this? What kinds of things would I look for? What are the elements of the student work that I see? And help use that to help you develop the performance indicators and the rubrics that describe the different levels of performance. Um, when you're writing those descriptions, uh, level one to level five, for example, it's easiest to start with the extremes and then work towards the middle. So you can more easily define what poor quality work is and what exceptional quality work is and then decide what the middle would look like. <clears throat> it's always good, too, to pilot test rubrics. Um, they don't work the first time. I can attest to that. But um, a trial run, uh, using it in, in uh, for example, in my own class or in a colleague's class, someone who's willing to participate, just to try them out um, to see if they indeed do reflect um, and clearly assess what the student uh, work looks like. And it is a, an iterative process. Uh, we've, we've changed our rubrics several times now based on uh, their failure in certain instances and, and the fact that they were way too detailed in, in other instances. So it's a design process and um, you should expect to change things, uh, to improve things as you go along and become more familiar with their use. So Gina, I, I guess now we have time for any questions about rubrics? Um, 
things we've been talking about? Again, there are no questions. Okay. I think everybody just wants to get out early. I had that same thing happen in class this morning. <laughs> so um, we're going to talk a little bit about how to apply rubrics back in the um, uh, very one of the very first slides. Uh, I mentioned that this is probably uh, the most important uh, element of rubric uh, uh, use. Developing it is difficult, um, and so you want to make sure that the time that you invest in developing rubrics gives you the value added that you're looking for. I think most programs do this. Uh, all the self-studies that, that I've written or that I've seen, programs do a very good job of, of determining where in their cur curriculum they cover certain outcomes. So it's, it's a good idea to inventory the courses, uh, <clears throat> decide where students are learning certain concepts, where they're actually practicing them, uh, and then where they're, they're, they're doing work or giving performance or designing something that actually uh, uses concepts from that outcome. So uh, things that we've seen fairly commonly are uh, curriculum maps. Uh, this slide is not in your um, handout. I added this at the last minute because I realized that uh, the next slide that I have wasn't the complete picture. This is an example of a curriculum map where courses are taken across uh, the, the curriculum from the sophomore through the senior year and which outcomes are covered and which courses are mapped um, for the entire curriculum. The numbers that you see here are, are just an illustration of the priority that the outcome has in any one particular course with five being high and one being low. So this is just an example of how um, I've seen many, many programs that take this approach to map outcomes to the curriculum. The next slide, though, is um, a subset of that. This one is an illustration of uh, a cycle of assessment in that on the previous slide, which I'm going to go back to now, um, you, you could assess every single outcome in every single class, but that would completely wear out your faculty. Um, they would get tired of the process and you wouldn't get anywhere, certainly not with program improvement. So if you take a subset of those outcomes and assess the high priority outcomes in, in each class, you can sample uh, outcomes across the curriculum, still get a longitudinal picture, distribute the load more evenly among faculty, um, and then as this shows, this is on a, on a two-year cycle where certain courses um, are assessed um, even number years, other courses are assessed in, a, in another table on odd number years, and then uh, we also look at the, the sections, the fall sections versus the, the spring sections, since some of our courses are taught twice. So you can diminish the role but of faculty and how often they have to assess, but, but the point here is, is that you have to know where outcomes are covered in the curriculum. The next uh, good practice is that you should also check with the faculty of those courses to make sure that they are actually doing something with that outcome and doing something with those performance indicators. A uh, faculty can mem member can say, sure, sure, we cover ethics, but when you ask specifics about it, uh, it what kind of assignments do you do? How do, are the student projects evaluated? Do you even evaluate the student projects having to do with ethics? The answers may come back completely uh, different. They may not actually spend much time on ethics. Uh, maybe they talk about um, plagiarism and cheating and things like that, which are certainly ethical principles, but, but when you talk about decision, ethical decision-making models or professional ethics, so forth, um, they may not cover those at all, which makes it difficult to assess if, if there is nothing that the students are demonstrating. So in this case, um, this is an example survey of whether or not um, a, an outcome of experimentation and data analysis is covered in class, in a class, and listed under that outcome in the left-hand column are four performance indicators that are components of that ability to conduct experiments and analyze data. And so a faculty member can look at that and say, yes, we talk about safe lab practice, uh, we ask students to take a quiz, and that's something that can be assessed. 
um, students have to write uh, objectives for their experiments and they submit that as part of their reports so yes that's something that can be formally assessed and so on down the line by asking faculty if they actually do something very deliberate and intentional in their classes to demonstrate that outcome um, you, you can have a reliable uh, track of deciding where you will assess student outcomes this is a, an example of another curriculum map. This program has really gone uh, one step beyond, above and beyond the call of duty. Um, these are um, uh, business classes where they have even mapped where concepts are introduced, where they're reinforced, and where they're emphasized. So if uh, the faculty wanted to do uh, longitudinal mapping, they could look at um, introductory material, reinforcing material and then emphasis material across the curriculum. Uh, the other advantage here is that if they need to correct an, a weakness, correct a problem, they can track back and see where a concept is first introduced to see if there is an issue at that level or at the next reinforcing level or at, at the emphasis level. So again, this is fairly detailed, but it, it sure gives you a good picture of where to go back and conduct improvements. So we're going to look at some rubrics, and um, this would be active learning, except that I have no idea of what <laughs> you're actually uh, doing. So we're going to walk through these. I'll give you a second to look at these and see if um, you can check yourselves on the, the kind of rubric uh, we're looking at. So here we have um, a teamwork rubric. Again, we've spent some time on uh, analysis of uh, teamwork skills. So think about whether this is an analytic or a holistic rubric. I think the giveaway here is that <clears throat> the descriptions are quite detailed. Um, there is a great deal of detail in this uh, rubric. Uh, if we look at the gray areas, the contribution, the taking responsibility, and the value of others' viewpoints, those are all what I would consider performance indicators. But in this rubric, which is analytic, obviously, is that the performance indicators are broken down even into finer detail. Uh, and there's a description of each attribute or each each level, each type of performance at every single level, at the beginning level, at the developing level, and so on, all the way up to exemplary. Um, this provides great detail um, in, in assessing the student work. Uh, I would imagine, though, that the faculty um, should would have to really be motivated to use this rubric because of all the various levels, all the different performances that they're evaluating at those levels. Probably rather complicated to apply. Nevertheless, it's an analytic rubric. Here is another one. The question to you is whether this is holistic or analytic. And the answer here is because the the descriptions are are grouped together under a under a level, and there are multiple descriptions under one level. Um, each describing a different attribute, this is an analytic rubric. A thorough under, understanding of, of teamwork <clears throat> includes all those features described uh, and bulleted under four. A good understanding of teamwork includes all those attributes and so on. So uh, a student would get a rating of, of uh, one, two, three, or four for their overall teamwork um, performance. Uh, that would include all those uh, bulleted, five bulleted uh, attributes under each level. So this is analytic. Here is uh, one on writing skills. And I think by now we're familiar with this being, again, an analytic rubric. Um, it has the performance indicators on the left. Again, these are a little bit more finely discriminated, um, but there's a description of each level of performance at each le at each for each performance indicator, um, thus helping uh, the rater or the faculty member understand exactly what they need to look for when they're rating student performance. <clears throat> 
So next I'd like to show you how you might use these um, performance indicators in the rubrics. And I'm going to um, show you an example of uh, student work. This is taken from um, a process control course in which students were asked to write a differential equation and then apply some Laplace transforms and, and come up with an answer of how a level relates to a flow into a tank. Um, the details aren't, aren't that important, but this was one problem in an exam. And this was used for assessment. Um, and this was done as the uh, exam was being graded. So a sample of student work was withdrawn from the, the entire class, making sure that the sample is representative of uh, the student body. And, and then a rubric was applied to uh, grading or to assessing that particular problem for, in this case, 22 students that were sampled out of a, 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 the entire class of 37. And this rubric, this isn't the entire rubric, it's just the first two performance indicators. There are, uh, there's another performance indicator that um, didn't show, did, wasn't, uh, isn't on the slide. So um, the performance indicator, the first performance indicator talks about the student's ability to apply first principles. And this scale is needs improvement, meets expectations, and exceeds expectations. So as the problem was being graded, the number of students performing it at each level for each performance indicator, applying first principles, uh, the next one is applying, applying appropriate mathematical techniques, there, there was a tally of, each, of the number of students performing at each level. Now even though there are descriptions for the needs improvement and the meets expectations and the exceeds expectations categories, um, there is a the, the columns between the 1 and 2 and the 3 and 4 allow for faculty to kind of fudge when they're unsure that a student is exactly at level 3 or exactly at level 5. So that gives a faculty member a little bit of freedom in deciding the borderline cases. There is also the possibility that when designing these rubrics, you may be applying them to um, an assignment or a project where a particular performance is not part of that project. So that's why the um, NA category, not applicable category, is on the extreme right. Um, and that's perfectly fine in, in the case of uh, general rubrics where you're trying to take one rubric and apply it across the board for assessing an outcome, whether it's a sophomore class or a senior class, that you might have an assignment or a project or an example of student work that, that doesn't ad address a particular performance indicator. And on the other hand, there is a zero where a student just simply doesn't demonstrate anything in that category uh, when, they, when they should have. So you take these tallies then of the students performing at the various levels, and then you can plot those much as we demonstrated in an earlier slide, how the percentage of students performing at an acceptable level. And here the threshold is shown to be 70% that perform at a level 3 or higher. Um, and so in the ability to apply first principles, 78% of the students performed at a level 3 or higher. Um, in the ability to use the appropriate math technique, only 50% of the students uh, performed at a level 3 or higher. And, and uh, similarly for the correct uh, performance of calculation, we had 88% of the students that performed at a level 3 or higher. So this gives us uh, direct evidence of uh, the fact that we know need to go back and look at how the students are uh, applying mathematical techniques or calculation techniques. That's where the weakness lies. When you break it up with the performance indicators like this, it, it will point directly to what is causing the problem, much more so than um, just looking at an outcome all by itself. So the performance indicators give us that discrimination. So that was where the problem was. <clears throat> These rubrics can also be used to construct a grading sheet. Um, 
performance indicators can be used to uh, this, for example, is a, a webinar uh, report that students have given um, in a class. And it uses some of the performance indicators, breaks them down, and puts them on a grading sheet so that as the students are, are giving their presentation, uh, the instructor can go through and check their performance at each level and end up with a grade, an overall grade um, for, for that performance. So even though, again, I want to emphasize that assessment or grading are not the same thing, rubrics certainly can play a major role in both assessment and grading. So to summarize then, I guess we've reached the end of the slides here. Um, if you're going to go through the endeavor of writing rubrics for your program, uh, you need to be clear about how the rubric is going to be used, how the data are going to be used, how many data are needed, uh, where you're going to do the assessments, um, and also um, which, which courses actually cover the material where the assessment can be done uh, correctly, adequately. Um, also, um, this shouldn't be overwhelming. Rubrics are not required for all outcomes. I think uh, rubrics are uh, extremely useful when you have something complicated that needs to be broken apart or, or kind of a, a less concrete concept, as I mentioned before, lifelong learning. What goes into lifelong learning? What does a student do in order to demonstrate lifelong learning skills? But if you're talking about uh, something with which you're familiar, for example, problem solving, you may not need to break that down into rubrics as much as you would uh, lifelong learning. Um, they're a tremendous guide. Rubrics are a tremendous guide for faculty um, in, in guiding program improvement, as I've mentioned several times. They tell you specific areas that need improvement in your program, and they help you target those efforts. And so make that whole program improvement process much more efficient. Uh, again, the importance of pilot testing the rubrics. It's a, it's a design process, so you will require iteration. It will, iteration will be needed to go back and improve those rubrics to make them uh, tailored to what you're doing in your program, what your needs are, and what your students are doing. And the other uh, value is that the better they are, the more reliability and validity you'll have in using the results of those rubrics when you talk about your program assessment. Um, the other item that um, I neglected to add to this slide is that I, was, I strongly believe that the use of rubrics really improves pedagogy. It helps us become better instructors, better teachers. We write better tests because we're much more specific about um, thinking about what we are going to be looking for in student performance, in the student work. And so it, it really helps us map what we've taught to what we're going to be asking on exams and how we're going to be asking students to portray that knowledge. So there is an initial investment, um, but I believe that there's a significant payoff in several ways in pedagogy and in program improvement and in really targeting our program improvement processes so that um, we don't spend time improving areas that don't need improvement and kind of missing our targets. So um, this is the last slide for questions. And I think that the webinar went great. Um, there are, again, no questions. I just want to remind everyone, if afterwards, when you're reviewing the slides, if you have questions, please feel free to send them to me, and I'll get them answered for you. Otherwise, I want to thank everyone for your participation. I want to remind you to fill out the closing evaluation. We do take all comments into consideration for future webinars. And the uh, webinars that we still have are preparing the site visit for computing, which is tomorrow, November 4th. How to Develop a Survey, November 9th, Preparing the Site Visit Technology, November 10th, Completing the Institutional Appendix, November 17th, and there are a few more after that, which can be found at our website at abet.org backslash webinar, and there have been some that have already taken place. This is the 10th webinar, and you can go to that same website to find out those. Um, some were offered free, so there is a link there, and you can listen to the webinar.